let me see if I can get this. Okay. Yeah. The first start is say hi in the chat, which people are doing, which is great. And it's really helpful to know who's here or just know people are here and they can, it's working. And we're talking about the web form modules greatest hits. And it's also the, the title is combined with an AMA because you can ask me questions. And just to introduce myself, my name is Jacob Rockowitz. I'm known as Jay Rockowitz on the web. I am a Drupal developer and software architect. I built and maintain the web form module for Drupal 8. So this is a different spin from my typical presentation. I actually did this once everything went online. I wanted to rethink how I was doing a presentation. And this is broken down into 10 segments. Each segment has a theme, but each segment ends with a Q&A. And prefix your questions with a capital Q and a colon in the chat so that I can see it and I can respond to it. And you can do it at any time. I can always come back to it. I have a little notepad here that I can take notes while I'm talking and you know, come back to a question if I can't answer it right then and there. And yeah, my goal is to answer your own questions. And something that's evolved with this presentation is it's really choose your own web form adventure. I mean, I start off with some basic stuff, but as we're going through, we can change direction. I don't have a problem skipping some parts of this, these slides. And you know, the first five sections are really broad, th the basics, building forms, submissions, configuration, elements, and handling. So those are the kind of the core things. And the last five are things really evolved around people asking me questions over the years that I think are important, conditional logic, spam protection, security, addressing headless Drupal, and you know, kind of ending with support. And I have bonus tracks I'm starting to work on around tokens, but all these topics are open game. And I think it's gonna change the choose, choose your own adventure in the sense that at different points, you could say, let's talk about PDF generation. And I can talk about PDF generation. I actually, you know, very easy to do. I even have my local dev environment spun up so I can go behind, look at some code if we have to talk about some APIs. And I'm good about, this is a general presentation, so I won't go too deep into code ever. There's no code in this deck at all. But I'm gonna start with the form builder and each section has kind of like a song. I'm not pretty, but I'm powerful. And you know, the, the form builder provided by the web form module, it's a simple UI for creating forms. It's, this is an important note. It's the form builder is accessible via keyboard and screen readers to all users. That emphasizes how accessible the web form module is. People can build forms with disabilities. That means there's full keyboard shortcuts and that means the output also follows that pattern. It's just an important thing. It's one of the most accessible form builders on the market. And the last one, last note here is always kind of developer specific, but developers can see and edit a form GML source. And I'll have to demo it to show it to you. And I'm gonna move ahead and give you a little quick kitchen sink demo. Well, not kitchen sink, but just a demo of the form builder. So I, I have a clean Drupal 8 installation and I have a contact form that's default that comes with the web form module. And for the demo, people see many times, I'm just adding a company. I wanna say your company, in this form. So I'm going to go in, hit the build, and this is the form builder. And I'm going to add an element. I'm going to add a text field. I'm going to call it company. Not going to change anything out of the box. The defaults are pretty good. And it adds it to the bottom of the form. And I'm going to go view the form. And there's a little company. It's not totally right because it should say your company it should come after your name. It sh should be required. And this is a good opportunity to show you, you can do this in the UI, you can definitely drag it up, hit required, hit save, hit edit, or you can go into the source mode, which is showing you the source code behind the form. And I'm going to take the company, YAML, move it up below name. I'm going to change the label to your company. I'm gonna make it required. This just gives you a hint of the power because you can copy elements if you know form API, which is what's powering this. You can type out your forms, you can make quick adjustments. I find it really helpful to edit labels. When someone gives me all the editorial for a form, I'll go into this mode instead of clicking around. I'm gonna hit save. And now we have another opportunity here to show you the test tab. And the test tab just lets you populate the form with the false data. It makes it really easy and I hit send. And I've generated a test submission. Boom, with a confirmation message. That's pretty much a walkthrough of the form builder. And we'll go back. 
And there's some tips and tricks here. Use admin titles under the advanced tab for elements to make it easy to manage your form and submission data. What admin titles do, if you have a very long question like, what, what is your age? You can put an admin title that's just age, and that admin title appears throughout the UI. And when you export and look at it, it makes it easy to understand what's going on. And developers and site builders should know how to use you know, the YAML source mode. That really empowers you to understand Drupal's form API and get you more familiar with how Drupal works with forms. And the last one is kind of the opposite is don't allow untrusted and non-technical users to access the YAML source. It's a dedicated permission to allow someone to get to that mode. If they don't know what they're doing, don't give them access to it. It actually could just confuse them. Are there any questions? Usually there's not at this point, which is fine. What I kind of like to do is I make up questions as I go along. Um, well, how does the admin title work? And there's also a new feature tied to that. And it's pretty easy to demo here. If I go over and you have your name, let's say your, your company and I want to make some notes to it. I could click edit and go to the advanced tab. And at the bottom, I can add an admin title. And really, company is just enough. And that's really what you'd want export in a spreadsheet. And you can say, this is a company element. I've used this to say to someone, do not edit this element. There's custom logic tied to it. Don't touch it. It's really helpful. So watch, I hit save. And you can see your company's changes to company. And it gets a little note here, which just helps people to understand. Um, Jeff asks, newest to web form, is, is the YAML a D8 feature with the development Drupal 7? It is definitely a D8 feature only. Um, if you go on Drupal.org and look up the YAML form module, you'll see the origin of the web form module for Drupal 8. So the YAM it basically started out with no UI. The UI for this for the web form module for Drupal 8 was YAML form, and this was the UI. You would just go type it out, and then I added a UI to it, and it's definitely a different feature. It's actually one of the more unique features of the web form module. I don't see too many other form builders on the market doing this. And it kind of ties together two things, YAML and the fact that Drupal's form API is really solid in how they're handling properties. And that's what these pound the hashes. These are properties that define an element. Um, I'm going to keep going and feel free to keep asking questions. Well, we've created a form and we've gotten a submission. Let's just talk about submission management. And that song's kind of titled, Show Me the Data. And when you start to look at the results, the columns can be customized. You know, reviewers can customize their results. So someone looking at it can say, I don't want these like individuals. So you could say, here are the columns that everyone should see. And here's an individual user can say, these are the columns I want to see. Submissions can be flagged or locked. And these results can be exported and they can be replaced with a view. So if you don't like the out of the box results that you're seeing, you can go into the Drupal views module and just create a custom view. And this is also worth demoing. And one trick here is you can go to the test tab and I'm gonna show another advanced feature where it kind of helps, we only have one result, so I'm gonna generate 50. And this is, I have the web form devel, uh, I have the devel generate module turned on, which allows this to happen. I'm gonna generate 50 submissions and it's gonna generate them and move us over to the results tab, which is right next to the test tab. We've got 50 submissions. When I talk about the flagging, you could flag a submission, Locking means no one can edit it, and you can even add little notes to a submission, like administrative notes. But we can also customize this. And to customize it, you might want to turn off a lot of the extra data that's not needed. We could keep the star locked in notes. Create is probably not important. But it is worth keeping the name, and you notice how that admin title kicks in, where it simplifies it throughout the UI. It makes it much more manageable. And I'm going to hit save, and we're going to get a much simpler table. And you can also go in and check off this box where each user can go in and customize their own table right here. Allow users to customize the submission result table. So now we have a results table. Let's just look at an individual result for a second. I had hinted that at the bottom you can review this result, but you can also download it as a PDF. You have the entity print module turned on and you can see the submission has been turned into a PDF and you have full control. Hopefully this works. Sometimes it fails just because of a configuration issue, but no, nope, we're good. Um, and you have full control over this. So you can make a beautifully styled PDF 
of a submission. So you can keep going. You can also edit it. I think that people understand right here. But let's go back to the results and talk about, so we've reviewed these results, we're happy with them and we wanna get them out. You can download these results over here. And for the demo, I do wanna emphasize that you can also download all the results as individual PDF documents. So you'll get a zip archive of all the PDFs. It's a great way, if I was archiving a web form, I would tend to download the results as a CSV and as PDFs. That if I have a certain submission and someone says I need a copy of it, you can look up the ID in the CSV and then get a PDF of exactly what's being, what was submitted with all the, you know, the formatting assignment. So for this demo, let's switch to an HTML table. Instead of opening it in Excel, I'm just gonna show it on screen. Every aspect of the generated table or CSV is customizable. How the headers are working, what elements are going out. You can even do some limits to it, but for now I'm gonna uncheck download export file and what it'll do is generate this on screen. And this is a simple HTML table that you can open in Excel. You can even extend this and style it any way you want. We've done a good amount with submissions. So let's go back up and we'll keep going. So views integration is really hard to demo. So I felt like the tip and trick here is these are the modules you might want to explore if you need advanced results or submission management. There's a web form views integration module um, that exposes all your uh, submission, uh, your web form elements to views. There's also the web form submission views token. It is a much lighter weight way to pull submission data. It's not sortable, but it's a way of like, you generate a, a table of submissions and then you're using tokens to pull whatever related submission data you want to be displayed in that cell. That allows you full control over formatting because the web form module has very advanced token capabilities. In a token, you can pull the raw value or a formatted value to your exact specification. The last one here, is the web form query module. And it's an API. And what it's doing is giving you a way to query submission data because it's not stored using fields for performance reasons. It's using something called an entity attribute value model. It's one table that captures all the data. And what this API does is it makes it easy to query that data very similar to entity queries. So in code, you're basically saying, get these, these elements, based on these conditions and sort by these values. It's actually an awesome API for anyone wanting to do custom stuff with the web form submission. So questions. So Dan asks, can you set up a web form so it tracks, for example, a certain amount of submissions like ticket seats and close after all the seats have been purchased? Yes, I actually can give, there's two aspects to that. You can set up limits for, let me see if I have one in here. Well, let's use, there's a demo of the event registration, which I'm not gonna go into, but I'm gonna go to the form. You can set individual submission limits to the web form. So if I go over to settings, which I'm gonna get to in a second, but it's fine to go here. I go to submissions. By the way, there's this expand and collapse all. If you collapse all, you can then see limits. And you can say the total number of submissions for this web form, for this web form per source entity. So if this web form is attached to multiple events, you can set limits per event. And actually, yeah, Dan, I think the key thing here is you wanna look at the demo event registration system because it shows you all the possibility for submission limits. It even includes, there's dedicated submission limits per, per option in a dropdown menu. Because when you said seats, it reminds me of, you might have a, um, an event where you got five rooms and you want people to book the rooms. And you can say, hey, in room A, six people can sit. In room B, seven people can sit. In room eight, nine people can sit. And it'll actually track that and close out those options as those are met. Um, when I describe these features, there's videos about every single one. I think that's worth one second. Because by the way, it's like you're asking this really great question and I can't answer it all. And yet I have a 45 minute video about it. So under the help section, I'm gonna demo this in a second and I'll skip over when I get to Type the word limit. There's a dedicated video about submission limits and it just walks through all the steps there. Um, let's keep going, we're in a good spot here. Yeah, and we, we really started diving into configuration and settings. 
And you know, the song here is everything and anything can change. That's really the, the mantra behind the web performance. Everything is adjustable. You can change the default labels and behaviors for every aspect of a web form. You can is enable or disable elements, handler, every single plugin, you can disable them, including external libraries. So the web form module depends on a lot of third-party libraries. If you don't want them or you include something else in your code, you can turn them off. And then you can configure third-party settings. And, and I'm not even gonna demo third-party settings, but when I say to you, well, the entity print module is a third-party setting, so there's a separate configuration place for that. And if you do spam protection, that's a third-party, it's an add-on, and you can configure that. And the demo is really about just getting you comfortable with exploring. So I'm in the default main page for the web form module, and I will start, I'm gonna start on the contact form we just talked about, and there's settings are web form specific, and configuration is global. And it breaks down hierarchical in the sense of you start from general to specific. So you start from the form, think about it, you build a form, you collect submissions, you display a confirmation, you send emails and handle stuff. And then the last two are advanced settings where you can add custom CSS and JavaScript or control access. Um, in here, every single message could be customized that's displayed. Almost nothing's hard coded. So in a, oh, and there's, examples of what the defaults are. And I'm gonna show you where to get to these defaults. And I think that's a very important thing to bring up. And I do like the expand on collapse all because it gets it very quick to be like, okay, here's all your options here. And you should explore and be like, what are behaviors? Behaviors are just check boxes that alter a way a form's gonna work. Disable client side validation, display a required indicator. I don't even need to hit these, but you should explore them and the tooltips help you understand what's going on there. Let's go to configuration now. So configuration is global. It's over here. And now think about the same thing, form, element, submissions, handlers, variants. Of forms, you can set certain default behaviors to apply to all forms. Some, are, some make more sense than others. It does make sense if you need to disable client-side validation for all web forms, you do that, you check it off, and then it'll check off that option on all web forms and disable anyone from unchecking it. Once again, if I go into general settings, all the way, all the defaults are here, and you can go customize them and apply to all forms. Don't recommend going crazy here. The more important thing you want to be aware of is like turning on and off features that you don't need. Um, so if I go here and I go all the way, let's let's use. Oh, sorry about jumping. Give it a second to look. So my machine is not happy with hopping right now. That's why it's slower than normal. Element types. These are all the elements available and you can turn them on and off. The best example is if you don't want users uploading files, turn off all the file upload elements. If we scroll down, the web form module ships with a password element, but it's disabled out of the box. And the example of why, if you check it off, it tells you that. It's stored as plain text. So passwords, you don't really want to turn them on because they're stored as plain text. You should probably enable encryption or take the passwords and put them to a third party. But we wanted to make that available to everyone. Um, the same thing applies to handlers and all the plugins you're seeing, you can turn on and off. And here's the example of third party libraries. And there's even, this is all the libraries. Sorry, I scrolled too fast, but you can turn on, say, I don't want to use select to turn it off. Um, are there any, well, let me do some tips and tricks, but if you have questions about configuration, I can go back. Listen, keep it simple. You don't have to change anything. Use the default settings when possible, disable unneeded functionality. And I like giving dev developers a hint here is hooks can be used to change default settings. So web forms are config entities, which means there's hook web form create, and you can hook into that and change the default settings for your web forms. You could. People have done, I like that example, where people have done when anytime someone creates a web form, they automatically have an email handler added to it with the right default setting. Just depends on your organization, but it's great for developers to know they can do it. Are there any questions? Okay, I like adding my own questions with the Is I wanna show you what the coolest new configuration feature is. And under the advanced tab, it was recently added, because there's this problem that web forms are stored under structure, but they're kind of like content. And it's very possible that you would turn on web forms and disable all these other options, and then it's kind of in an awkward place for most users. It's sitting under structure, 
And the content area doesn't really support the rich UI of the web form module. If, uh, if you go here, and I'll show it in the side tab, you're just getting a series of tabs. It's very limited. So you can't really add web forms here and then have all the nested tabs. So in the advanced section, you could display web forms as a top level menu item in the toolbar. It's better just to click the button, check it off and click it. And actually this feature makes it easier for me to proceed with demoing things. Because what's gonna happen is, and what's doing is rebuilding the menus because I'm moving where web forms are in the UI to next to content and before structure, and you get a dedicated menu that gives you full access to everything. Um, it's an optional feature you can turn on and off, but I think it's a really helpful thing for people doing really big web form installation. So let's jump into elements. Every question you ask people matters. And so there's example modules, and there's a web form examples module which has this style guide. It shows you examples of every element it's a kitchen sink, oh, I like that word, and showing every single text format, file uploads, cute kittens, ratings, signatures. It just gives you a starter and you go in and look at how they're configured. You can also tweak this and create your own style guide. Full examples of all the entity references, little bit hint of composites, which I'll talk about in a second. And then it just shows you the styling of all your elements and like even how your messages are gonna be displayed. So you can use this to kind of set up your designers and themers to kind of know exactly how all the forms are going to look. It's like the, the example, the starter form that everyone could look at and get all your, your styles working. And this is zooming in on one element. I just love this, this slide because it shows you the power. This is just about titling and labeling. So out of the box, you can add a title to an element. That's good accessibility, but you can add a tool tip. And you can even add placeholder text. And then below placeholder text, you can have a piece of just, just a description, or you can use the more sawed out. Um, all of these are available. I do not recommend ever doing what you're seeing on screen on your forums. It's overwhelming. And the point here is each one of these options has a different use case. So in the web form modules UI, I use tooltips heavily. The use case is that one, people are coming back, I, I need to save space, and people are coming back to the same forms over and over and over again. So generally, they don't need this help text. They only need it once. So tooltips allow it to be just there, and they get used to it. And if they need help, they roll over the tooltip. The description is helpful because it's just a little piece of text to kind of augment what people are typing. And if you, if they, if you want to remind someone of something, always use a simple piece of text below the input. And the more is for more, lots of text. I use it in healthcare forms when you're describing something in like two paragraphs, and you need to say, you know, like you might have the more, you can change the label. So you can say, what is a PSA? That's a prostate antigen test. And then you slide out and you can have text with links and images. And I, I've used it even for that, where it slides out a whole page. Depends on the form. Um, and I like showing this element. This is a computed twig element. So this is doing calculations on the fly using Ajax and twig. It's going to the back end and adding numbers together and just kind of just gonna demo really, you got value A, B, and C, and then a twig element, you click through, and you get a little twig that adds those two A and B, data A and B to equal C, checking off the do it in Ajax. And then there's a computed token, which is identical to twig, but it's just taking token values. So the idea is someone selects the user, and we're pulling user data into dedicated elements, and we're putting tokens in those values. And Composites, I've given a hint about. It's multiple elements working together. It's like selecting a bunch of data points, like an address. In this case, we're creating custom profiles for a company. And you can have multiple or single. The last one, I'm gonna take a sip before I go here, because this is a, a lot for people to digest. You can build your own custom option element. So there's an example of a buttons element. It's like web components, where you're setting up, like what's the HTML twig markup? What's the custom CSS that I want this to look like? You can even add a little custom JavaScript. And then I'm gonna to go to the preview tab. And this is just creating buttons. And you can just click through and it selects basically in the background as a drop-down menu. I'm going to the next one, and this is the real power where you can also set an SVG. And in an SVG in the markup, you could say an ID and text, and those are parsed, and it then generates a map. Well, this is a map of the United States that's fully clickable with panning and zooming. And what's important is 
really what this, it's a module, it's called, the, I think the web form options custom module, it's concluded. Um, it's layering on JavaScript to one, make this possible and make it accessible. So everything you're seeing here is fully accessible with keyboards, um, proper tagging, labeling, and all that stuff. Um, I use it for medical forms where I have a diagram where I need people to click on the diagram. So some tips and tricks for elements. Um, every aspect of an element is customizable. That's just out of the box. There's over 80 properties you can choose from. But start out with basic elements. You know, keep it simple, add a text field, and then see if you need more functionality than that, or check boxes. Um, use computed elements with Ajax sparingly. That, the, the challenge there is it's, it's very intensive on the server, server because it's going back to the server and doing a full calculate, full render of the form and a calculation and bringing back the result. And I've seen people get hit pretty hard if they've got cascading computed Ajax elements where one element triggering another. Um, and just be aware of that. It's like a, there's actually no warning when you create these to be, be mindful of the, the performance implications of this. Um, and this is for developers. Elements in code provide the most flexibility and stability. And there's examples of creating elements in code. And what, what that means is you get this element in code, there's one version control, two, it's available to every single form, and your developers have full control. They, they can add their own custom validation rules. They can go have, like all the options can be dynamic based off of some third party you know, so, source. And it's just very, very powerful when you start doing it. Um, any questions, just add them with the queue. I think you can do, okay, I'd like to run a web form through a workflow with multiple submitters like an approval flow. Um, that's a great question. There are several, um, wow, you may, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it and then I'm gonna have to actually add this module to it. Okay, so the answer is there's no great immediate workflow, so you have to install add-on modules and there are workflow related modules. Um, without doing a third party module, what I have done is you have full access controls over your form. So you can have a form, like I'm going to have to just illustrate it in a, in a form. On this contact form, if you wanted a workflow where the person who gets the email needs to do some reviewing, you can go to the form and add extra fields like an admin notes field. And then when you're in that field, you can go to the access tab and say who has access to it. And that gives you kind of a really low fidelity way for, for example, Someone fills out a form, the workflow that you need them to approve it, you could add a checkbox to say approve and only give the user who can approve access, access to that element. Um, and you do it right here. So for example, when someone could update, a, when they're viewing a submission, they could go see that data. When they're updating a submission, they could see that data or creating it. Um, that's the out of the box. Now, if I go to, and by the way, I'm really glad I added this one. If I go to add-ons and type workflow, I think I might even have a dedicated section for that. Let's see. Workflow. So Maestro is incredibly advanced, unbelievably advanced workflows. That's like CRM level um, flow charts and everything. And it, a web form can trigger a workflow or a web form can be part of the workflow. There's also, and I'm going to have to add it, core, there's a workflow field, like moderation field module that can be integrated and that brings in core's workflow into a web form submission. I haven't used it, so I can't give a full review over it. I'm actually writing it down because uh, it's really important that I get that out there because people did some work and it made a lot of sense of basically using this content moderation field. Um, I lost you guys for a second. I'm gonna keep going. Feel free to ask more questions while I'm talking. And handlers. So we're really getting to the end of like what's the core stuff in the web form module. And we've got 15 minutes left and we're fine. I, I don't like stressing about time. Ah, thank you. Workflow moderation. Um, every action should have a reaction. That's what handlers are about. They are triggered when someone submits a form. Um, hold on, I'll get to that question in a second. So email we talked about. Remote posts, I'm gonna demo. Um, that's taking your data and putting it to a third party server. Actions and settings, I don't demo, but it's important people are aware. It's like rules. You add this handler, and when someone submits a form, that handler can tweak how the form is going to work or how the web form submission is gonna work. So the example with a form, and an action goes to a submission. So ready, someone submits a form, 
and they enter in a certain value, like this is a high priority issue, and the action handler can flag the submission. And you can do that using conditional logic. So you can say, trigger this action based on these conditions. Someone said this is a high priority issue. Settings is where you can tweak something like a confirmation message, which is coming from the web form module. It could be very similar. Someone could check a box and say, this is a high priority issue. And using a setting handler, you could change the confirmation message to say, we hear this is a high priority issue and we'll get back to you in X amount of hours or call this number. Um, finally, there's a debug handler, which just shows you the data. And if you're writing your own handlers, it's worth, when I'm debugging any issue, I like to look at the data. And that's what that handler does. And this is going to demo the email handler. I'm going to skip it because I want to go to the remote post because I see more value in that. It's just walking through that you can add an email. Scheduled email handlers, I will say, very go back to the event registration system. It allows you, someone to submit a form, and you could say, one day before the event, send out this email. And some tips and tricks here, enable debugging. Um, handlers connect, this is a really important thing. So a handler is a plugin, has a lot of methods. It can act on a form, validate and submission, and entities. So the idea there is on the web form, someone hits submit, you could do an action, or you can validate that submission. But you could also, when the web form submission saved in a handler, you could trigger something. Um, so the, the Sometimes that's really worth doing because sometimes at an API level, you're saving a submission, a web form submission, and you'll want to do something. Don't forget handler support conditional logic. It's a really powerful feature. I mean, that means any aspect of a handler, you say, ah, I don't want this to execute or send out these three different emails. Um, and handlers are extendable plugins. And it's really important when you get to a handler, if you're like, I don't like this one, you could extend it, change it. You could remove features by extending. You could turn off features. Um, I'm going to do questions. So can a web form now have more than one author? The answer is no. I, I, that would be the, um, the, you can, but it doesn't really track revisions because they're config entities. There is a, a web form, like it, it will create revisions for each one of your web form changes. And there's a web form logging aspect where you can log all the changes. But it's not like you can have multiple authors and collaborate on a web form. That definitely doesn't work the way one would expect. Um, and it's because they're configuration entities. Very, think about it like views. Views are a little tricky to have multiple authors. Uh, Chad asks, um, would you use an action for a scenario like this? User can fill out a questionnaire, like a personality test, that adds a value to a user profile field. Absolutely, but the <laughs> it's... Um, Handler definitely could do that. And the question I'm now realizing in this presentation, I'm going to start talking more about it. Um, if I do a search, let me see, if I do content creator, there's, there's two aspects. It's, we're talking about entities. And there's not like a generic solution, but the web form content creator will create nodes on the fly for your web form submissions. Why is that a good thing? Well, one, let's say you have a form with 200 100 different elements um and you want you really want 20 of those elements into fields because it's a little easier to manage in views and you can integrate your site content creator does that if i do a search for a user there should be a submission user no user registration so create a new user upon form submission that's a great example module um it's really powerful it does a full integration with user registration more than just the original question okay I'm gonna keep going. We got, we got 10 minutes left, we're good. We can go over. Conditional logic. I hinted at it, ask me the right question at the right time. There's two types of conditional logic. There's conditional logic um, and variance, and they allow you to tweak a form based on submission data. Conditional logic, you'd use it to hide and show or acquire elements. Variance allow you to just alter every aspect of a web form, labels, behaviors, any settings. And conditional logic is as simple as demoing it. I'm going to use the templates, the web form templates module. There's a medical request form. I'll preview it. When I say conditional logic, I'm basically hiding and showing elements. If you're a caregiver, I say, what's your relationship with the patient? And I ask for their information. I go back to patient. Turns out, I'm not going to jump to the admin UI to show you that. But always start with conditional logic. That's the most simple one-on-one thing. 
And conditional logic in the Webflow module uses Drupal State's API, and it's worth kind of understanding how that works, especially when you're looking at the source. Um, the example I gave you, use containers to group related elements so you could hide and show the container and not every individual element. Um, that's exactly what I was doing in that demo. I was taking a, your information was a container with a conditional logic, not each element. And gradually implement variants. And now let's just give you variants 101. A web form variant is an alternate instance of a web form that adjusts settings, elements, or behaviors to yield a better result. And variants, you know, this is an A-B testing example where basically I have an A version and a B version. And the A version is a compact, horizontal aligned form. And then, oh, that's the A. And if I go to the B, it's going to be a vertically aligned with radio buttons instead of select menus. And you can test those two options. Um, that's a very basic example. And that's really the thing with variants. It's a crawl, walk, run thing. You want to start really simple and get more advanced. And you can use variants. I'll use the second bullet to make the first point. You can use variants to organize audience and, speci audience and organization specific web forms. It's called segmentation. Dan, at the end, I'll add links to the slides. Um, and with segmentation, the idea is I have a form, I have a contact form that's available to 100 different companies. And at the top of the form, when I know company A has come to the form, we want to display a dedicated phone number to company A. So I've created 100 variants of the form, which just change the phone number at the top of the form. And when they come, I know which, who they are, and I display this dedicated phone number. And what's really powerful about that is you can, variants are designed to support unlimited variations with no performance implication. It happens once at the beginning, it applies it, and you're good to go. And you can implement your own variant plugins, and they give you a lot of flexibility. So that phone number one, I just wrote a very simple form. It's a list of companies. You click edit. It asks for just the phone number in a dedicated field with actually custom rules on the phone number. Um, and it makes a big difference. Variants are very tricky to ask questions about. I definitely recommend looking up web form variants because there's a dedicated blog post about it. Um, spam protection, I'll speed up a little bit. Everyone wants to know about spam, so stop sending me your junk. These are the three I recommend, and they all have their issues. Honeypot puts a hidden field, Antipot uses JavaScript, and Capture, we all know, frustrates the hell out of it. Um, and in the add-ons, you can find the spam protection modules. Capture works the best, but it's the most annoying. Honeypot can be good enough without annoying users, and this last one is really important if you need performance. Spam protection modules may disable page caption. Capture definitely does. The idea is if that the spam protection requires some user-specific input, it's got to disable caching. So caption has to display an image and get a response that's specific to that image. So page caching goes out the window. There is a recipe I, I've started to recommend, and it's a combination of honeypot and antibot. And it's not honeypot time limit. Time it would disable page cache. It's putting a honeypot in and antibot. So the idea is there's a hidden element in the form that robots have to figure out, and the robots have to have JavaScript enabled. And that recipe doesn't kill page cache. I'm going to go to securing submissions. And I'm going to what I'm going to do with questions now is do them in four minutes at the end so that people have to go to another place, they can go there. Um, I don't trust you, I don't trust anyone. So securing forms, a couple of options. You can encrypt the submission data. You could disable the saving of submissions that never goes into Drupal. When you do that, you could by default send an email or you can remote post it to a CRM. Or you can, and I also just recommend, let's say you are sending emails or remote posting, you can schedule the purging of those submissions. That is a very good best practice where you're basically saying, I wanna hold on to this submission for a week. And I think you're getting a hint that you have full levels of access controls to submissions, kind of addressed as GDPR. And disabling results, <clears throat> I do like this demo because it really shows one of the most powerful things about CRM integration. So I'm going back, I wish I would fix this up, going back to the contact form. I've done this demo enough where I can actually do it in less than a minute and a half. I'm clearing all the submissions because what we're gonna do is say, we don't want this to go into Drupal. We want it to go into our CRM. And I go over to settings, and I'm gonna say, disable the saving of submissions. 
And if I didn't have email, it'd, it'd give me a big warning to say, you're gonna lose data. But in this case, we have emails going out, so we're not losing data. But now we want this to go into our CRM. So we're gonna remote post it. And we go in and use this dummy URL. And one great thing about this demo is the debug. You can control what data is being posted. I'm not gonna go there, but I am gonna go to the advanced and enable debugging. The reason you wanna do that is it'll show you if there's errors and it shows you exactly what's happening. And if I hit send, it's gonna fail because the URL was not a valid URL. And I get a big red box at the top. Wow, the actual action took one. See, it said unable to complete the request. Here's all the debugging information. This is what you sent, this is where it went, and it was a 404 because the place doesn't exist. But it also even gives you a hint of how you do response tokens. So if your response returns to own, it will parse that and you can take that code, whether it's completed or the response code and put it into your submission if you're writing it into Drupal or even into an email. I'm gonna keep going. Ooh. Oh boy. I lost my slide. So we're gonna do one more and I will finish. Sorry about that. Well, this is a great, like, I could just act like this was an honest mistake because I wanted to get to you the URL of the slides, but. Um, well, here's the URL of the slides. They're always shared publicly. So I'm gonna put this into the chat. We have a minute left, which is actually not a horrible tragedy. Um, I need to pull this down, out, present, and go to the last one. And what we're gonna miss is support, but the I shared the slides, so the support options are listed at the end, and I'm gonna zip through. Look, I spilled a cup of coffee on my keyboard when I started this, so this seems trivial to me to have this level of mistake. Um, other than it gets you a little jumpy. And we're here. And I like just talking about sharing of web forms. And I wanna share my web forms because you wanna distribute them. You can do headless, there's some modules for that. You can get them into GraphQL, but you can share a web form. And there's a web form share module. And what it does is it gives you a little JavaScript snippet or an iframe that you can embed in a site. And the preview tab shows you this gray box is an iframe loading the web form. That gray box can be placed on any site and work seamlessly and it resizes automatically. And yeah, the headless web forms can't support most advanced functionality. That's one of the problems because you have to rebuild everything from scratch. Um, sharing web forms, it definitely provides the most reliable user experience. And I want to emphasize that shared web form that in that gray box can have any dedicated simpler theme that you want. You can apply a dedicated theme to that. And for example, I probably would start and use the bootstrap theme because it works really well and then put a little styling on it so that if you're putting in some other sites, you just have a nice generic looking form that kind of fits in most designs. Um, questions? I am, okay, I'm gonna keep going. Just getting help, there's lots of options. Um, there's rest documents, documentation, cookbook recipes. You can ask, get answers at Stack Exchange and use the issue queue if you find problems. And there's videos about every web form feature. You should get involved. I'm jumping ahead because I want to make sure people, you can learn more about me at jrockwoods.com. And I do want to push people. So coming up, of course, me, I'm three hours ahead of you, but it's lunchtime. And at 1230, you can do a pet meet or greet with Anna Jen, 12, um, 1230 part two of li living wisely and maintaining balance and meaning under modern conditions. And 1 p.m. is the contribution lounge. And these are the sessions coming up next. So stick around for more. Um, and these are some bonus tracks. I actually hit a lot of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, hey, do you have questions? Um, there are 23 people still here. I will stick around and answer any questions that you want, or you guys can slowly exit or finish eating your sandwiches because you guys are still doing, or starting lunch, or starting to eat your sandwiches. Um, are there any questions that I can address while I take a sip? Well, oh, it's, it's a pleasure. I really like doing these sessions. 
I, I, I've got to get this Q and A down even better because uh, I think this is where you get the value. It's very hard of these online um, conferences because it's hard to just I don't know watch some w webinars. To me, don't always work because you kind of want to be able to be like, wait, 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 tell me about that. Um, of course, there's a lot to go through. I don't know. I, I almost want to go to my bonuses because it's like if there's 22 people, I could keep talking while someone thinks of a question. Let me see if I can get my mouse over here. Oh my God, cards is such a fun feature. Um, selector. Well, Adrian's sticking around. Okay, I'll I'll talk about tokens because this is the deck I have. It's it's important. Here's the thing with tokens: is that sometimes you need a little extra magic. And we know what tokens are. They generate placeholder. They, they're placeholders for generated values. You can use them to display submission values. You can reference entities. Definitely use the token module. But what I wanted to do is throw up some tokens on the screen and walk through them. Um, and and just I'm going to use the pointer and I'll answer that question that just got posted. But look, you can grab an element title. You can grab the remote post completed number. But this is where you start getting into an individual value. You can grab the value of the subject of the email. You can add a custom URL. These are all documented when you have the web form token module turned on. And this is going all the way. Get the note, by the way, the event registration demo uses this token. It goes out, ready? The web form goes out to the event node and grab the field web form demo event date, grab the date format to the short and inserts it into an element. And you can use these tokens for that. And this is ridiculously important. These are web form token suffixes. What these do is you add them to the end of your tokens and they do things. So let's say you can use the clear. If you have a token and the value doesn't exist, it'll remove the token. People won't see it. If you're taking tokens and inserting them in different contexts, the last four help a lot. If you need to put a token in a URL, it'll URL encode the value. If you need to insert the token in an XML, you can use the XML encode. If you know what you're doing and you need to decode HTML entities, you can do that or you can even strip tags. So in, okay, so let's see. The question is, in an office setting where standard forms are used, what's the best approach to building a web form to print a standard PDF? I mean, it's definitely the entity print module. Um, and it that module does a great job of generating PDFs. And you, um, like without going into like, oh, you can go, you can get into the theme layer of the entity print module and tweak everything going into the PDF, but this is worth doing like, here's third-party settings. So down here at third-party settings for the entity print module, I can go and specify the header and footer of the template and inject some custom CSS to tweak it. Um, I will make some recommendations. Um, WKHTML to PDF, is by far the best PDF generator in the open source community. Um, but it needs to be installed on the server, but services like Pantheon come with it. Um, it's basically, when it says WKHTML to PDF, it's the Chrome PDF rendering engine. So when I hit print here and I save whatever I'm looking at as a PDF, it's pretty accurate in that in WKHTML to PDF. And it does pull your print files, so that can help. This is very specific. You can also, you know, just a note, you can add a debug link. You can style that link at the bottom. Yep, yeah, WK, it's all one word. WK HTML to PDF. Um, it's fairly well made. I've used it for a decade already. So I got it, even when they don't support it for a little while, I give them a lot of credit. Um, okay, do you know anyone using Webform for a robust event entry system? Absolutely. Like, well, Martin asked the question and it's really, is it, um, event registration system or like a um, call desk, you know, event could be call desk. Event registration, yes, people are using it. There's a demo of it. Um, oh, I, I'll definitely answer Dan's question. Those are great, great questions. Um, so yeah, I, I'm trying to think of the limitation there, and it's not. I mean, one of the big architecture changes, because it seems like some people are coming from D7, is web forms can be attached to nodes, so it makes them very reusable. So you could take a web form and attach it to dozens of event nodes, and you have an that's like, boom, you have an event registration system because web forms track where the submission's coming from. So you, that's like web form 101. You immediately get that out of the box, and then you can layer on 
for example, the scheduling of emails before, the tracking, the inventory, the limits. Um, I'm trying to think of what hasn't, it's pretty close, frankly. Oh, uh, oh, I don't think there's elements to do. No, you, keep in mind the events coming from a node. So you have all that power in a node and then you're just having the registration there. Um, well, Dan's like, sadly, we're still, you know, running, I understand the pain of running Drupal 7. Are any of the modules you discussed possible for, oh, D7 mod, web forms? Not real. no. I think um, web D7 people have wound down support. So it's rare that those modules are getting updated. They still exist. Um, I'm trying, but a lot of the D7 modules that have been brought into the web form module, they're not really relevant. Like the web form table, there's full table support in the web form module and the CSV stuff is kind of built in. The script has been ported to D8. Um, yeah, and it's a big shift. It's from seven to eight, web form was completely rewritten from scratch. I mean, I basically took over maintaining that and you just have to get used to it. There is a migration path. Um, Andrea is asking, what's the best source for D8 Marketo integration? And this is a funny way. I, I think about it this way. There's no way I know every aspect of what people are doing with web forms. That's why all I do, I, at least twice a week, I search around to see what add-ons people have created. Let me see if Marketo has one. There isn't a Marketo integration. Well, one thing to say about that is um, it's very easy to also just look at other integrations and copy that code. Because it's really about pushing data to most CRM systems, it's about pushing data to it. Um, where someone fills out a form and you push it. That's why the remote post handler exists. So you can copy a lot of that code. Um, that's the best answer, sorry. I hope someone does an add-on for that. Um, I use Salesforce. Oh, payment is a great question Chad's asking about event registration and payment. Um, let's do that here. And there's two, well, payment, there's the donate module, which is an example, but commerce, and this is heavy, but you, you can install the commerce module and this commerce web form order add-on is well supported. It's a handler that gets added. And essentially what it does is it goes from when someone fills out a form and they hit submit, this handler goes into the commerce module, generates an order number, record number, and redirects them to payment and customize the whole process. And I've seen it incredibly successful because if you think about it, most payments are always two parts. Fill out the form, go to the payment. You are going down the commerce path, um, which I, I don't think is a horrible path because it's a great module that's well supported and you're only talking about core commerce in most cases. It's com the core commerce payment and that order handler. Um, the other option is to redirect to third parties and I've done that too. And you know, that's considered more safe. Um, I haven't, oh, what is the, I just wanna see, uh, so I think I'm missing some because, ready, if I go to integrations, if we scroll down, there might be other integrations with systems that support payment. That's really what I was just, authorized net, for example. Yeah, you just have to look through them and think about what integrations you want to search for. Um, we have four minutes left and you guys should, well, oh, you guys are at lunch, so it doesn't matter. Um, and the, oh, so there's 18 people here. I mean, I it's a Saturday for me. I'm kind of chilling. Um, trying to think of other other cool things to. Well, that's what's great about this um, this last slide here, where I have my list of kitchen sinks because it gives me tons of ideas of what can be demoed. Um, and some are more complex than others. And what's good about everything you see here is there's dedicated blog posts about doing modals and stuff like that. Cards I like to demo, I'm really proud of that. Um, and I'll demo it because what it is, is web forms for a long time supported multi-step wizards. And I'll go to a wizard example. So we're on this, this is an example of it's a wizard, it's a multi-step form. The way this is working is each step, I'm gonna do the test tab, is going to go back and render the next page using Ajax, it moves back and forward. And yes, this seems fast because there's five steps here, but no, it's taking 
a quarter second to a half a second between each step. So when I click here, that took a while. If I click back, it keeps hitting the server. <clears throat> what if you want to have one question per page in the web in doing a wizard? Doesn't work. You have 30 questions. That slows down things dramatically. So what cards are is taking the form, rendering the form, and moving all the logic from multi steps into JavaScript. And what I and this is just a warning that we're going to lose data, which is fine because we're going to didn't submit it. And if you have the web home cards module enabled, you can convert your wizards to cards, or you can build them from scratch. I hit convert. Gives you a little warning. It's experimental. And what it's going to do is change wizard page to cards. Keep in mind, you can do that in the source mode. And it's made these old cards. They almost look identical to wizard pages. But then it says add, add card. If I go here and I go over to the test tab, it's going to look exactly the same. I do add this little border for a good reason, but it's instantaneous. It's super fast because this is all JavaScript with client side validation fully supported. And if I go here, then I'll show you like a nice little feature. The little box is here because I added a shaking behavior for client side validation not working. You know, if you get an error, you want to kind of tell people. Um, so I'm doing a massive survey. It's 30 questions and you're paging through it. It even has keyboard shortcut. Like uh, I'm going to not use my mouse and go to the next button. But from here, if I click the left and right arrow, it'll just navigate forward and back. Um, this is just really powerful. And it's kind of solved. You know, this is almost like faking a React form. It's kind of making it a front end framework form where everything's happening on the client and the performance is a tenfold game. Um, yep. There's 17 people left. So, well, you know, well, okay. Well, when you say 17, it's like half of them are eating sandwiches or doing something else. And then some people are still here. Um, for Adrian, I think the thing you want to take in is like, the demos, and you know, I don't do this, but it's worth kind of just, if I click extend, there's kind of two things happening. The web form module in the Drupal community has the most extension period of any module that's being outside of core. And you can see my crazy stuff here, but I'll go to the bottom and Here's the web form, by the way, that's because everything, there's all these modules here, but these are all different. Well, some of these are add-ons, but some of these are like, there's a web form bootstrap module. If you have a bootstrap theme, it helps just clean things up. Web form client-side validation module does integration. That's where they always will say integration in the description. I have all my test modules turned on, so you're gonna see that occasionally. Um, what you get to is you get examples. So. Here's, wow, by the way, these are a lot of add-ons I use, but here's examples and demos. And these are kind of like little recipes to do the event registration system. And there's another demo of an evaluation, application evaluation pattern. Similar to event registration system is someone fills out, oh God, yeah, that Bob, I'll, I'll address that in two seconds. But uh, you, you have an application that someone fills out and similar to workflow, then you get that application, you have people evaluating that job applicant and that's a system. It just shows you how to glue these things together. And okay, when you do your demos, do you usually just install all the things in the sandbox, including add-on? Um, oh, well, this demo, I have like a script that runs through a lot. I try not to turn on too many things. Um, I do with the demo modules and the examples, do them on a test server, but never do them on production. I mean, I had someone, the event registration system kind of borked in 6.x in terms of uninstalling. And I tried to help the person, but that's still in alpha, which by the way, no one's even asked that question about Drupal 9 support. <laughs> and I'm gonna avoid it until someone asks it. Um, examples, you're just gonna get examples of everything, even creating your own remote post handler. And that, you know, even using variants, there's examples. And what's great is if you're a developer, you look at the code and you start to see the patterns. Um, all those examples, there's examples of every single plugin that exists. So you can understand how an element plugin works, how a handler plugin works. For real advanced users, there's a ton of test coverage. So there's a ton of test modules. So if you wanted to fix paragraphs, you check off this one and you get a default installation of paragraphs. 
Uh, thank you, Martin. Yeah, it's really hard to, I, I, I'm only doing this module. That's how I support something so complex. It's like, that, this is my job in the Drupal community and I stick to this one task. Um, okay, I've gone for an hour. I think everyone should get lunch. I'm gonna go out and enjoy my day. I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone. Enjoy the remainder of your week and I hope you had a good time at Bad Camp. And I'll probably see you again somewhere online. Yeah, and always ping me if you have questions on the side.